are good. You are good. You are good, Chris. You are a funny guy, you know. <laughs> After we heard the beautiful stories of Michelle, now is the theology, okay? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I am Archbishop Gustavo. I am the Archbishop of San Antonio, Texas. It's a, it's a city. Yeah. All right. San Antonio, and um, it's a city that just a few days ago, according to some studies uh, that were released, that is a city that is growing the most this year in the United States. And at the same time, we are celebrating, just that you will know something a little bit more um, about me and the ministry, it's a city that is celebrating 300 years uh, this year. And just digging a little bit more about the history of San Antonio, we found a, a book, a register in our, in our archives that has the registration of sacraments. And it's dated to 1703. So that began on this side of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo. And then that was San Jose Mission, and from them, in 1709, they moved to, the, the Franciscans, they moved to San Antonio. And nine years later, there was the body of, of people who started the church, I mean, the, the, the city. But so faith was before the city. Already the faith was there, and we have the five missions. One became, later on, the Alamo. Some people, they think that the city was founded with the Alamo. No. No. It was the faith of the people and eventually those missions. And, uh, but they were Franciscans. So I want to make the connection with what you have here. The Franciscans. And one of them, his name was uh, Antonio de Jesus Margil. He was stationed in Mexico for years. But then he walked from Mexico to Panama, preaching missions, and then from Panama all the way to Nacogdoches, one side of Houston, and eventually stayed in San Antonio, and he was part of building two missions. But it was the faith, just to think about walking, walking from Mexico City to Panama, Panama all the way back, and eventually San Antonio. It's the faith, and here there is a lot of faith. I had the opportunity to be today praying with the Franciscans, having benediction, and, and uh, Father Nathan has been a great angel to me. Um, wonderful. It's faith, faith. And faith is a gift. We don't buy it. It's a gift. But while that is one piece, the other piece is, um, and on that, thanking the Franciscans for the missionary activity in the world, in the world. And then also in the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And this province of the Franciscans here is Sacred Heart province. So we are very blessed today. But I would like also to teach you, I mean, uh, Chris, Spanish was too fast for me to understand. <laughs> I will teach you one word in Spanish. And that word is, ven. 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 Okay. And now I will ask you to repeat a few times during the talk. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Oh, uh, we have quite a crowd here. <laughs> Let me go back to my archdiocese. <laughs> Remember not the events of the past. See, I am doing something new. From Isaiah 43, chapter. Remember not the events of the past. See, I am doing something new. 
This passage was uh, spoken originally to a people who were lost, disillusioned, far from the home they had once known. They experienced alienation, chaos, near despair. An enemy had destroyed Jerusalem and taken the people of God into exile in a foreign land, different customs, different languages, different religious beliefs and values. And many of God's people felt abandoned and began to lose their God-given identity because of the experience of exile. God sent a prophet to tell them that all was not lost. All things are possible with God and for God. God will lead them back home to the promised land. God calls them to look to the future of hope and confidence. The community of faith needs to listen attentively to the prophetic word in every generation. See, I am doing something new, says the Lord God to them and to us here and now. The book of Genesis describes God's creation as bringing order out of chaos. And it was one, one lady, as we were praying earlier before coming here, she expressed very clearly, she plays the violin, very clearly that that was his, her favorite book, Genesis. That book, however, the forces of evil remain in the world, sowing hatred, violence, and chaos. And God's power to overcome the powers of evil means that God constantly recreates the world and challenges us to cooperate in this work of new creation. God doesn't need our help, but he does. He wants us to help him in this recreating the world. The book of Genesis also describes the first creation as a wonderful garden in which all creatures live in peace and harmony. When Adam and Eve disobey God, alienation ensues within themselves with one another, with the garden environment and with God. So all these relationships were broken. Something happened. God exiles them from the garden, and their lives become ever more difficult. There follows a series of sins that increase in, sense, in severity and violence and leads to deepening experiences of alienation. However, there is an element of salvation in these narratives. Adam, or Adam and Eve do not die immediately upon sinning. God puts a mark on Cain to preserve his life despite his fratricide. God saves Noah and his family from the destructive flood. The Tower of Babel, episode, that episode leads to the worst possible alienation. The inability to communicate with one another. The scrambling of language. Moreover, there is no element of salvation in this story. However, that is not the end of the story of salvation, of God's creation and recreation. God then, then sends an elderly couple, Abraham and Sarah, on long journey, promising to give them a new land, to make a great nation of them, despite their infertility and to bless all the nations through them. What could this blessing be for others except to overcome the punishment of Babel, to allow people to communicate again? And I, in my, my, my own life, uh, well, not my own life, my family life, uh, my parents, they couldn't have children. They made a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe and I, I will not tell you the whole story, but I am the first of 15. Yeah. 
For, so fast forwarding through the story of salvation, we come upon the powerful, creative event of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes in a mighty wind with flames of fire upon the disciples gathered in fear in the upper room. They are transformed into confident evangelizers who boldly proclaim the recent Lord Jesus and his gospel to people gathered in Jerusalem from throughout the Mediterranean world, each of whom hear the Aramaic-speaking disciples in their own language. God's promises to Abraham and Sarah are being fulfilled. See, I am doing something new. The Holy Spirit is active in our lives and in our world today, as throughout history. We are called to be led by the Spirit into a future. We are called to, led, to be led by the Spirit into a future. So we say, Amen. It had to happen. I knew, I knew. <laughs> so, what does this entail? What is our current context? What are our goals for the future? And what obstacles we will need to overcome? What gifts we will need from God to carry out our mission and ministry, which are the same as Jesus' mission and ministry? Let us consider, for example, that according to a United Nations report, in 2017, there were over 250 million international migrants. Over 65 million of them refugees last year throughout the world. People far from home offered trying to escape numbing poverty, widespread violence, and threats of imminent death. The numbers are staggering. Statistics can leave us sad, but feeling powerless to help. Each of these people has a face, a name, a mother, a father, a family, gifts, and potential. Another reality of our world today Geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting. Volcanoes of violence are arising in diverse areas of the world. Hawaii, Guatemala, lately. Another situation in the world, tsunamis are rapid change and are destroying cultures. Poverty overwhelms people who struggle to keep heads above the rising flood waters. Our own country here, economics seem to be up, but there are more poor, or are more poor people today. Racism is rising. Sexism, anti-Semitism, anti-Islamism, ageism seriously diminishes diminish the lives of both victims and perpetrators. So do, we do not despair. But we must also be realistic about the world in which we live and pray, work, and play. With God, everything is possible. See, I am doing something new. Do we believe this? Are we willing to cooperate in this work of recreation? What will this require of us? Closer to home, there are times when we feel alienated from others, from the environment, from God, as we have heard the stories. Sometimes we feel alienated from parts of our true selves, aspects of our life we keep hidden, perhaps even from ourselves for, for time. We simply do not feel at home with ourselves. That is part of our reality. There are opportunities for growth. These are, these are. Yes, for deepening our spiritual lives 
and with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit guides us, leads us to the truth, consoles and challenges us, gives us wisdom and prudence. When we feel alone and lonely and conflicted, we cry out, Ben, Holy Spirit, Ben, come, Holy Spirit, come. And the Holy Spirit is with us and within us here and now. God never abandoned us as we sang beautifully several times tonight. The Spirit can lead us back home with our true selves and help us discern our mission, the reason why God has brought us into the world. At times, we may feel also no longer at home with the people we live with, spouse, parents, brothers and sisters, and we heard that in the stories. Or with neighbors, with people who speak a different language, attend a different church or synagogue or mosque, or whose skin color is different from ours. In our great nation today, and even in the church, there are growing divisions, increasing tribalism, hardening polarization. Paul Francis says that diversity must always be reconciled by the help of the Holy Spirit. He alone can raise up diversity, plurality, multiplicity, while at the same time bringing about unity. We need the Holy Spirit in our communal and civic relationships. We need reconciliation, healing, mercy, compassion, justice and peace, harmony and unity. All of, of these signs of the kingdom of God already in our midst. See, I am doing something new. Two years ago, when Pope Francis made a pastoral visit to Mexico, I concelebrated that Mass with him. And after Mass, I was placed first in a line of bishops to greet the Holy Father. <coughs> and I told him that he is the Pope of the Holy Spirit. He smiled and moved on to the next two bishops. Then suddenly he turned back to me and said, pray to the Holy Spirit that I not do something foolish. <laughs> he needs a lot of Holy Spirit. <laughs> my friends, I believe that, that my daily prayer for the Holy Father is being heard by the Holy Spirit. Pope Francis has been consistent in sharing his vision of the church's mission and ministry with us. The Holy Father reminds us that we are all, all, all sinners in ongoing need of conversion, of transformation through the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. He has called for the church to be merciful and compassionate. And here tonight we see that we are so open to it. But not everyone is so open to see the mercy of God in somebody else and to see the compassion of God in somebody else. Above all, his vision includes five things that I will come into you. Encounter, dialogue, inclusion, accompaniment, Four. <laughs> and dialogue again. Let us briefly consider each one of these elements and how they will lead us to cooperate with God who does something creative and new in a time of darkness and chaos. Encounter means more than a mere nod of acknowledgement of someone's presence or a quick handshake. Encounter requires that we offer a safe heaven to someone who has been buffeted by the waves that threaten to overwhelm him or her. 
It means creating a secure place where someone may enter in order to be at peace, to share one's story, to do so without fear of being charged and condemned. It means creating a space where a person may come out of the darkness into the light. A person where one's human dignity and worth are respected and affirmed. A place where someone may come out of the numbing cold to enjoy the warmth of God's loving embrace. Encounter primarily involves respectful listening with integrity to one's story. Understanding another situation over bridging a cultural gap means being will, willing to walk in their shoes for a time. That in itself often brings healing, encounter. Next, dialogue. It is not merely a pleasant conversation. As a bishop, I have learned that how and when we say something is often as important as what we say. How and when we say something is often as important as what we say. St. Paul wrote about living the truth in love as a way to grow in Christ and into Christ the head of the body. If we live the truth in love, that should form the way we speak and act. A popular style of communication today is die tribe. A bitter, abusive denunciation, attack, or criticism of someone or some, someone's views, and our actions. The Thy Tribe gives expression to bias and prejudice. It is misleading and divisive. It threatens to dominate our public discourse. The Thy Tribe is inappropriate for the Christian life. We have several schools in the Archdiocese, a good number of schools in the Archdiocese, and just gathering with the children and, and asking them to share with me in small groups what is going on. There is a lot of bullying. A lot of bullying. These little ones, they are picking up from all levels in our societies. They are picking up what is this I thrive mode. And it's so sad. There are more suicides, as we heard, now in our country, in the world, than ever. Dialogue is quite different and vital to the Christian life. Jesuit Father John O'Malley has written that. Quote, he creates or fosters among those it addresses, a realization that they are all share or should share the same ideals and needs to work together to achieve them. To engage in persuasion is to some extent to put oneself on the same level as those being persuaded. Persuaders do not command from on high. Otherwise, they will not be persuading but dictating. And this is a model worldwide today in many places in the world. That is the model. Sadly. Persuasion works from the inside out. To be successful persuaders need to establish an identity between themselves and their audience and make clear that they share the same concerns and even the same sentiments, such as hope, joy, and sadness." End of quote. Blessed Pope VI said that dialogue must be accompanied by that meekness which Christ bade us learn from him, himself. 
arrogance, and offensive bitterness do not foster dialogue. Confidence is necessary. Confidence in the goodwill of both parties to the dialogue. It requires mutual trust and respect. In a dialogue in, constructed with this kind of foresight, truth is wedded to charity and understanding to love. Dialogue involves a common search for the truth. It demands a capacity to listen to someone with integrity, listening attentively to a different point of view without let go unnecessarily of one's own values or view. Let me em emphasize here that seeking and speaking the truth is absolutely necessary for dialogue. Mutual trust and respect imply that all parties to the conversation are telling the truth and willing to acquire new insights into the truth, the reality. So alternate, alternative facts, fake news, spreading unfounded rumors, disseminating false information are antithetical to authentic Christian discipleship. Pope Francis, in his message to the World Communications Day this year, says, the tragedy of this information is that it discredits others, presenting them as enemies to the point of demonizing them and fomenting conflict. Fake news is a sign of intolerant and hypersensitive attitudes and leads only to a spread of arrogance and hatred. That is the end result of untruth. Today, there is a growing lack of respect for truth in the world and increasingly or increasing willingness to engage in distortion of the truth, propaganda, and even outright lying in the public forum, in the public media, media and also in social media. This prevents all of us from coming together in mutual respect and trust to solve the serious common problems we face with our neighborhoods, in our nation, and among the nations of the world. We live in very dangerous times. But the Holy Spirit today is calling us to sincere dialogue and will help us. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And that's why we call then Holy Spirit then. Then Holy Spirit then. Then Holy Spirit then. Third point, inclusion. Inclusion means that everyone is a brother and sister. That everyone is our brother and our sister. So we need to make an examination of conscience. That we are created to the image of God. Every person has innate dignity and human rights that are to be respected and defended and nourished starting in the womb. Starting in the womb. And no one is to be excluded. Everyone must have a place at the table. Pope Francis has consistently and constantly reached out to the margins. In his papal visit to unexpected places, in his appointment of new cardinals, in the care of the homeless, the imprisoned, the poor, the unemployed, no one is excluded from his pastoral concern. He lives the belief that God shows no partiality, has no favorites. Everyone is a beloved daughter or son of God. Everyone, 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 everyone. And we sang it today in different ways with beautiful music and, and good spirit. So the, the Holy Father challenges us to go out to the margins and encounter those who have a right to hear and experience the good news of God's love, mercy, and compassion. 
You know, my, the, found, I have, the founder of my community was a French priest, and the, found, the foundress was a woman, married woman. Her name was Conchita. And in her dialogue with the Lord, the Lord shared with her and say, you know, your heart, inflamed by the Holy Spirit, will be able to say to me. So you will say it, Conchita. There is a heart in me. You, Lord, you will find a home. But then, the Lord taught her also to say that about others. As long as there is a heart in me, you will find a home. As long as there is a heart in me, you will find a home. As long as there is a heart in me, you will find a home. Number four, accompaniment. Come to me, all who, you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. From Matthew. This beautiful passage may seem quite unrealistic to anyone who is carrying a heavy burden. But Jesus does not deny the heaviness of our concerns and responsibilities. Rather, he offers to help us carry it as our yoke made, as we sang also in one of the songs. A good yoke is one that fits one's shoulders well and doesn't shake. It just fits right. Jesus offers to accompany us on our pilgrim way, helping us carry what may be heavy luggage. That makes all the difference in the world. It makes a big difference. We are called and sent as missionary disciples and accompany other people along the way. And in sometimes it's very complicated. Sometimes it's very simple. But to accompany means to be with. Yeah. Other people who are struggling under the weight of their condition. True encounter is the first step. Dialogue is the second. Inclusion of others in our circle of concern leads to accompanying them on their journey. At times, we need not to say anything. We simply need to walk with another. When people know that we are with them as they follow the way of the cross, their pain and agony are easy a bit. At the same time, we will also experience some of their pain and agony, which is never easy. Is what good fathers, good mothers do good friends do, they carry the suffering of the other. Not only alleviate it, but carry that suffering themselves. Sometimes tears are the price of accompaniment. We hear it with Michel. Cry, to cry. In his pastoral visit to Mexico, Pope Francis said that we need to be capable of weeping. We need to be capable of weeping. To a quote from the Pope, to weep over injustice, to cry over corruption, to cry over oppression. In other words, not to get used to, to cry. These are tears that lead to transformation, that soften the heart. They are the tears that purify our gaze, and enable us to see this cycle of sin into which very often we have sunk. These are tears that can sensitize our gaze and our attitude, hardened and especially dormant in the face of another's suffering. And they are the tears that can break us, capable of opening us to conversion. This is what happened to Peter after having denied Jesus three times. He cried, and those tears opened his heart. 
end of quote. And it's true, you know, we saw so dramatic, dramatic expressions on TV and the news, you know, about what is going on in the world, all the fightings and all, that we get used to. You know, we get used to that. May the Lord grant us the gift of tears. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As was said by Michelle, and Pope Francis also said it, we cannot put the Holy Spirit in a cage. And the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are the traditional seven gifts, but the Holy Spirit has plenty of gifts. And for everyone, and in any time, in any time, so, the Holy Father knows the human, human condition well. He knows that the tears we shed for another may have a profound effect on our own life, bringing us a transformation of our mind, our attitude, our behavior. The final concept is discernment. And also, we heard about that earlier, about a spiritual director. I just... Uh, after three years, had a graduation in San Antonio of 45 spiritual directors. And it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Because all of us, we need to hear the Lord, but to be mediated by someone besides the personal experience that we have of the Spirit. Discernment means listening carefully to the Holy Spirit, often speaking gently in our hearts. At other times, to the unexpected events, we experience the presence of the Spirit. Or strangers that we meet, and the Holy Spirit comes at work. So this sermon helps us understand God's will for us. It is very easy to pray, thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is quite different, truly, to mean that we are listening to God and are willing to respond to his call, being obedient to his will. So this sermon helps us understand what we are to do in various contexts. Not everything works every time and with every person. Is this the time to take a stand or to be silent? Is it time to scatter stone or to gather them? That's in Ecclesiastes. Will I put my freedom or another's in jeopardy, in harm's, way, in harm's way? Is there something I can realistically do with others and with God's help to alleviate an injustice? Why am I simply tilting with a windmill with no realistic hope or success? Is this the moment to boldly proclaim the Lord Jesus and his gospel? These are all matters for discernment, discernment under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So, how will the Holy Spirit lead us into the future if we are willing? What will be the way the Holy Spirit to work? Jesus and Mary are our examples of proper responses to God's will. Jesus emptied himself, became incarnate in our world, and was obedient unto death dead on the cross. That is why his father exalted him and called us to recognize him as Lord. In, the, uh, in his homily, Pope Francis at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City reminded us that Mary's encounter with the angel did not hold her back since she did not consider herself privileged or make, her, or make her hesitant in leaving those around her. On the contrary, he renewed and inspired an attitude for which Mary is and always will be known. She is the woman who said, yes, 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 of surrender to God, and at the same time, a yes of surrender to her brothers and sisters. This is the yes which prompted her to give the best of herself, going forward to meet others. Be my ambassador, she says to us. 
giving food to the hungry, drink to those who thirst, a refuge to those in need, clothe the naked and visit the sick, and don't forget to carry the baby in the womb. As I did, she says. Come to the aid of those in prison. Do not leave them alone. Forgive whoever has offended you. Console the grieving. Be patient with others. And above all, beseech and pray to God. And in the silence, tell him what is in, in your heart, what is in our hearts. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we are called to stand in solidarity with one another and with others, especially the most vulnerable. And we are not alone. The risen Lord is with us, and the Holy Spirit is with and within us. Mary is with us. Our Lady is at one with all people. She is the mother of us all, the mother of the new evangelization, the teacher of the new dialogue. She promises to accompany us, her people, telling us not to be afraid of the darkness and the violence, the hatred that is so much part of our world. She is the protector and liberator of the poor, the downtrodden, the neglected, the detained, the deported, and especially the children, the unborn and born. To the Holy Spirit, she brought into the world the Word of God incarnate. She will help us to be incarnations of God's Word of mercy and compassion justice and peace, harmony and unity, enduring love for all peoples, all God's people, all God's people. As Pope Francis has reminded us, Jesus wants evangelizers who proclaim the good news, not only with words, but above all, by a life transfigured by God's presence. See, I am doing something new. Let us be part of this wonderful work of God's recreation today, led by the Spirit into the future. Led by the Spirit into the future. Another word that just came to me for Francis is, because we have great challenges into the future, but also great hope, but he said, a lot of, we're facing a lot of evil things in the world. The devil is at work. But I say to you loudly, God is stronger. Amen. Amen. So ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Ven, Holy Spirit, ven. Thank you.